so this is a fantastic text from Paul. Who can be problematic? A fantastic text from Paul following a particularly problematic text from Paul. The first part of Romans, if you go digging around in there in that, in that uh, 13th chapter, the first few verses, Paul is telling us, uh, them, and therefore us, to obey the authorities. That's why you pay your taxes. He says this really beautiful thing about how the authorities are in authority because God put them authority, and resisting them is sort of resisting God's plan. I don't like that <laughs> at all. Uh, it, it is often a text that's used to squelch resistance. It's often a text to use to keep people in line, keep them minding their own business. Now, you know how I feel about minding our own business. You know how I feel about not resisting. We have to resist, right? So I didn't ask Pam to read that first part so I could save that for another time and really kick it in the teeth. I mean, really wrestle with it. Um, we don't have to agree with all of the things that are in the Bible to be Christian. I know, Mark, what? The Bible is a book that is script for our lives, that is written by people like us, just like us. Michael would have been writing that Bible if he was in Paul's time. People just like us, inspired by God's extraordinary Holy Spirit, trying to wrestle with theology. Amen? So when I read it, I don't have to click my heels three times and say I agree with everything in it. I just have to wrestle with it and find out what its meaning is for me. So with that in mind, I'm going to go past that problematic, crazy text and go to this beautiful text where Paul is continuing to talk about what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit brings us the ability to really fully love each other. He's teaching us about what it means to be the community of faith, the people of God, the beloved community, and what love looks like. So I'm coming down there now. I'm going to tell you that not only do I, don't I agree with Paul, I don't love what my big fat commentary said about this text. So I'm throwing it over here. And uh, um, what does it mean to really love each other? In the context of anger and disappointment and rage and unbelievable grief, which is what I feel right now about the state of our nation. Am I by myself? No. Not only that, because we're global citizens and we see everything that happens all over the world. I don't know about you, but there are days when I wake up feeling this heavy cloud, like a low-level depression. I don't do depression, but I have a low-level kind of malaise and sadness because I feel powerless and overwhelmed by all of the stuff. All of the stuff. Are we in the, peace of, are we in the climate agreement or are we out of the climate agreement? Are we building a wall or are we testing building the wall? Are we charging the wall to the Mexicans? Why are we so preoccupied with the Mexicans? What, are we going to put the trans people out of the military? What's wrong with the trans people being in the military? What about women? What about children? What about health care? What about DACA? Holy cow. There's so much to be sad about, so much to be worried about, so much to be uh, just depressed about. When I started this sermon writing for the week, I thought I was going to tell you the things that are in the middle of the bulletin. What do you need to wake up to in terms of justice and find a project on the website to do? But I think my question today is a little more interpersonal, a little more personal, a little more private. How do we wake up to love? What does it mean to be woke in our interpersonal relationships? Now, I got to tell you, I don't know, it might be obvious. I'm a teeny tiny bit burnt out from all of the organizing we've done this year. Teeny bit tired because I worked all summer. I took a, a week off. But mostly, I'm tired from the fighting. 
I'm wiped out from the violence. I'm wiped out that we haven't learned from our mistakes. Some buttheads turn planes into bombs, and they set the World Trade Center on fire, and they set the world on fire, which was, by the way, their intent. So now, people who look Muslim, Sikh people, and they do say Sikh, not Sikh, Sikhs, misunderstood, misidentified as Muslims. Are terrorized in our country for looking wrong. Sixteen years ago, Barbil Uncle was killed in his own gas station parking lot because he looked Muslim. Muslims go home. Women's arms set on fire in shopping centers, and that's just one piece of it. Anti-Semitism's on the rise. White supremacy, which we thought was about to die, has had a rebirth, like the rebirth of the ugly nation. And I'm exhausted. And when I'm exhausted, I make mistakes. So I'm asking myself, what does it mean to wake up to be an activist whose heart is full of revolutionary love? Paul says in this text, with which I don't have a problem. We know what time it is. You know how Jesse Jackson used to say, "What time is it? It's nation time." Some of you don't even know who Jesse Jackson is. <laughs> who is Jesse Jackson? What time is it? When Paul asks that, when he tells us we know what time it is, the word there in the Greek is not chronos; it's kairos. He's saying, "You know what time it is. You know what kairos it is." And the Kairos time isn't the chronological January, February, March time. The, the, the Kairos time is the God breaking in time. You know what time it is. Paul is alluding to us living between the now and the not yet, the what we are praying for and the and and the thing as it really is. He's asking us how do we live with love in this in between time, in the meantime, in between time. How do we live? How do we live with love? And you know, I'm an extrovert, so. Often I'm out here thinking about how to live with love, but honestly, guys, right in my heart, my broken heart, my troubled, broken heart, what do I need to wake up to? I was at a, a thing with Richard Rohr a couple weeks ago in the mountains with John. Me too, and he's very cute in person. Father Richard Rohr is just cuddly, smart, 75-year-old Catholic priest who uh, is really trying to help young activists think about um, how to be um, spiritual as they do their work. How, what does spiritual activism look like? In other words, he's trying to wake it up in them a spiritual undercore, underpinning for the work that they do. So there were 60 young people, and then there were five elders, and me and John were two of the five elders because I'm now an elder. I, I've discovered um, at 58, and so uh, one of the young leaders actually is a member of our church, Lindsey Branham, called me and John and said, "There's so much going on with Charlottesville, so much craziness going on. Can you help us talk about race?" Right? So we did. We had a spontaneous kind of gathering, pulled all the people together, and we had a talk about race. We did some structured questions, like when were you first othered because of what color you are or your racial ethnic uh, heritage. We asked when did you ever other somebody. We put people in small groups, and they got really vulnerable and really honest. And then we had the people of color come up front and make a little bit of a semicircle, well, with, to the sea of the white nice people. A couple of Muslim girls, a Latina girl, a couple of Asian women, a couple of Muslim women, and all of us listening to two black men. One of the black men said, "Please forgive me, because I'm going to indicate what he said, and I'm not going to swear." But he said, "I'm worried that white folks don't give an f." Youngish black man from Atlanta. Um, Somebody, one of, the, one of the Muslim women said, you know, we still feel really invisible. So it was very honest, very sincere. There were lots of tears. There were lots of crying. It was beautiful sharing in that unusual way that happens in the world but happens at middle almost all the time because we set a multiracial table. <coughs> thank you, God, and thank you, middle. At the very end of it, uh, a person had had her hand up a few times, and I saw it, and I was doing my group 
I see you, you know, hang on kind of thing. And I almost didn't call on her, um, but I did. And she said, I just wanted to make a comment about my multiracial family, my biracial family. And she started telling us her family is biracial, there's a black father involved, that she's white, but she's got a black half-sister and, and this kind of thing. And I honestly, when she started talking about her biracial family and kind of like her creds, you know, like her creds, the, the black people, the Latino people, the people of color, like our bodies started, you know, like we were like, it was a little funky, and then people started looking at each other and like, what the? And I felt like the mama responsible for the people up front and the thing, bad thing was happening. And so when she got through talking to a therapist, and I said, you're a therapist, and I, I think you can take this. I just want to tell you, when you are in a group of brown people who just told their stories, you don't have to talk. I said, you don't, you don't have to talk. And everybody's like, yeah, that's right. Because she didn't have to talk. <laughs> it was not her turn to talk. It was her turn to listen and receive. Middle church, we are so sophisticated about that. She wasn't that sophisticated. But she was well-meaning. She was well-intended. She was a good person. And I really hurt her feelings. I mean, I really hurt her feelings. And let me be clear, I was right. <laughs> I was. And when I got through saying it, I said, and if you think I'm wrong, you're wrong. I'm right. There's a time to talk and there's a time to listen. But I really hurt her feelings. Did I mean to hurt her feelings? Did I want to hurt? I did not, but I did. So when I'm talking about waking up to what it means to be a lover, a revolutionary lover in these days, I'm asking my own self, what, how do I interrogate myself? I am sophisticated and smart about race, but how do I interrogate my intentions? How do I stay in touch with my own stuff so that even as I'm trying to confront or care front or challenge or fix or even fight injustice, that in my heart the intention is absolutely mindfully, mind-blowingly love. Which is to say every single one of us and I know more about me than you, <laughs> but every single one of us is a walking wounded. Every single one of us is broken around some axis. We got dissed on the playground, we had to hide our sexual identity or our orientation, we, we, our parents were stinky, mean, or our siblings broke our hearts, or, right? The first love relationship we had, annihilated our trusting spirit, every single one of us. And I know some of your stories, and I'm not telling your particular stories right now, but your stories are in my heart, and I know you've been through it. And going through it can leave us wounded and wounding. Hurt people hurt people. So I'm wondering, you know, I've asked you to be on a journey with me toward completing God's dream. And right now I'm wondering about our interior work. Like, I really plan to tell you, let's get busy! <laughs> and we need to get busy. But I think we might need to get busy also here. Just right here. Um, so that the things that break us, that crack us wide open, leave us both vulnerable and ready to heal the world, but also get healed enough that we don't hurt other people. And that's the same kind of heartbreak. Our cracked wide open heart is what actually makes us empathic and sympathetic and, and sincere and get in it to fix it. But there can be a kind of crack in our heart that if we don't pay attention to it, will just fester and become pussy and yucky. And from that place, we'll hurt somebody else. So now my to-do on the bulletin, that is not on the bulletin for you, is to ask you about your spiritual practice. Yes, I said it, Christina. Where's Christina? <laughs> Christina's my spiritual practice guru. What's your spiritual practice? You know, my spiritual practice is often exegeting for my sermons. Um, 
I love writing my sermons because it makes me study. But I'm not still nearly enough, nearly enough, to let peace wash in me. I'm not still nearly enough to pay attention to what's going on in my body. And I want to be a revolutionary lover when I'm out in the streets. I want to be loving even my enemy, especially my enemy, when I'm trying to convert them. Now, caveat, I am not saying hang out with your enemies and have tea. <laughs> I am not saying if somebody is hurting you, abusing you, taking advantage of you, wounding you, stick in there, hang in there till they beat you to a pulp. I am not saying stay in places that give you soul death or in relationships that erode your character. Oh, hell no. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we are our primary first relationship. And it is not narcissistic to pay attention to how your heart is and to wake up to who is in there and what's in there, and to interrogate what's in there and know it so well, exegete it so well, know you and the stuff so well that you get to your therapist, get to your spiritual director, get to your friends, pray to your God and clean up the plaque that is old wounds in our hearts so we can love, 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 and heal the world at the same time. I don't exactly know why I'm teary about that, but I'm telling you, it's my work and it's your work to do that work. I love you. <laughs>